Hey guys, so for 7.2, we're going to talk about uh, food stores and, uh, and types of energy. So when you think of food, I want you to think of stored energy. Okay, so food equals stored energy. It's a form of chemical energy. The macromolecules of various foods, this is uh, lipids, you know, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, are storing chemical energy. They're storing energy in the bonds that create them. So when we talk about cellular respiration, oftentimes, nine times out of ten, what you'll hear described is how plant cells and how heterotrophs uh, that, that eat plants or other animals uh, take sugar and break it down into ATP. We're also going to follow this convention because it's the simplest way to do it. However, you can also produce ATP from, from carbohydrates from from fats and proteins, right? So it's not just carbohydrates, it's also fats and proteins. You can see this in a lot of people. A lot of people don't eat carbohydrates as part of their diet and they're they're perfectly capable of producing energy from fats and proteins. In fact, fats have more energy per gram per weight than either carbohydrates or proteins. That's just a, a proven fact. So there's lots of stored energy in fats. Okay, so we're going to talk about breaking foods down. So foods like peanuts. Peanuts have carbohydrates in them, they have fats in them, and they have proteins. A very good food source, uh, peanuts. So you take carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. You can break them down. Uh, you can take these macromolecules and break them down into their, their constituents, okay, so into their subcomponents. Uh, if you remember your vocabulary from earlier in the year, you can break carbohydrates, like uh, complex carbohydrates, chains of sugars, down into their monomer sugars, right? So they're individual sugars. Fats can also be broken down into their components, which are glycerol and fatty acids. And proteins can be broken down into their monomers. If you recall uh, that, uh, the, the, the individual monomer of a protein is an amino acid. And you know how I like to remind you of stuff from the past, so you might want to remember your monomers for various macromolecules. I'm just saying. You might want to write that stuff down and remember that. All of these subcomponents, so amino acids, sugars, glycerol, fatty acids, can be put into cellular respiration. So there's various pathways. And they can produce ATP. Okay, So there's multiple sources of energy that can be put into cellular respiration to make ATP. We'll learn the specifics of this process in 7.5. So 7.5 is actually going to be a really big deal. Uh, we're getting there. That's going to be the, the really robust section for Chapter 7. Okay, So we're not quite there yet. I'm not going to give you the details yet because I don't want to uh, cloud your mind with too many details. I want you to think about the process. The foods you consume have stored energy in them. They're broken down, and in the process of cellular respiration, energy is created in the form of ATP. Okay. ATP is energy. Okay, moving right along. So what about different types of energy? So in class we'll talk about the differences between uh, different types of energy. I know that you've had this stuff before. I know that you've heard uh, the terms potential and kinetic energy. I know you know the differences between those things. Uh, in the in class we'll also uh, talk about some different analogies that display the differences between potential and kinetic energy. So with potential energy, if I hold a marker up in the air, hold it really high off the ground, it has a lot of potential energy. Its, it's potential, the further, its greater potential energy the further you take it away from the ground. A pendulum, if you, if you put a tennis ball on a string and you made a pendulum, when you pull that pendulum back and don't let it go, that's stored energy, so that's potential energy. So I want you to think of potential energy as stored energy. Okay. A coiled spring is an excellent, excellent analogy for uh, potential energy. So if you, have a, uh, if you have a spring, right, and it's not compressed, it's just like this, but if you take it and you compress it, all this energy has essentially been pushed back here. So now there's lots and lots of energy stored here in this compressed spring so that when it releases it's going to release a lot of energy. Okay, So there's high amounts of potential energy in these uh, three examples. 
Now you transition and release that energy. It becomes kinetic energy or, or active energy. Uh, kinetic energy when, when these things change, right? So if a, this person on, on a slide way down, way up here, uh, once they come down to the slide and they're in the water right here, uh, this potential energy is gone to kinetic. Energy has actually been released and then you're going to be in a lower energy state once you're at the bottom of that slide. It's essentially the same thing for a marker held up high. Uh, when you drop that marker to the bottom, you go from potential to kinetic energy and energy is released. Released. Okay, same thing with the pendulum. The pendulum flows through uh, from being held. That energy, that, that potential energy has been converted into actual energy, into actual action. Same thing with the spring. Once it's released, that energy is now realized. It's no longer potential. It's been made kinetic. Okay, so what happens to that energy, though? So the energy that's stored in potential energy has to do something. Uh, this pendulum, if you were to let it swing, uh, what would happen to it? So let, let's say you let this pendulum swing right into a plate of glass. What would happen? Well, that energy would be transferred from the pendulum into the glass and most likely break it. Same thing with a spring. If you let a spring uh, release itself, uh, it will you know, hit whatever's next to it, potentially knocking it down, knocking it over. Uh, this guy on the slide right here, once he slides down, that energy is going to be transferred to the water. And you can visualize the energy. When he hits the water, right? What's going to happen to the water when this person's sliding, this kinetic energy hits the water? Well, you're going to see a splash. The splash is that transfer of energy that is made kinetic from the person to the water. Okay, so I hope that helps clarify some of that uh, the confusion between potential and kinetic energy. Now, when we're talking about cellular respiration as a process, as a, as a, as a whole, uh, I want you to think about it compared to an actual car. So uh, car versus cell. In a lot of ways, they're, they're very similar, and this analogy is apt, because uh, we have here an input for a car that's going to be the energy source, and that is gasoline. Uh, gasoline has high potential energy, high, P, high PE, okay, and it's, it's very similar to, in, in fact, actually structurally, it's very similar to a fat molecule. But if you put this gasoline into a car and add oxygen in the form of an engine, you get combustion. That combustion is going to provide energy to the car in several ways. Uh, the, the combustion engine is going to turn pistons inside the hood. Pistons will eventually turn uh, the wheels round and round, and then your car is going to be able to go uh, somewhere. It'll be able to move. That's the, that's the kinetic movement part. Another energy that it releases is heat, right? So if you feel the, the hood of a car that's working, it's hot. Uh, that, that's another form of, of, of kinetic energy that's been made mobile uh, in the form of heat. Because of the burning of gasoline, because this, uh, this reactant has been put in, into the system, you're going to get, in addition to the energy to move the car, it's not working, move. you're going to get some byproducts or some, some uh, what are actually pollutants uh, in, the, in the case of a car. You get carbon dioxide and water. You can literally see the carbon dioxide and water, especially now that it's getting colder, you can see it coming out of the tailpipe of a car. Those are the products uh, of our car moving. It's the same thing with the cell. If we put in sugar, which is high potential energy, doesn't matter if we put in a fat or if we put in a protein, it's the same thing. If we're breaking sugar down, the cell can actually uh, take that sugar in and create ATP with it. Uh, ATP provides energy to do cellular work, so those are all those chemical reactions. So unlike the car that's actually moving around, the cells aren't zipping around. Some of the mobile cells are, uh, but these are really just providing energy to do chemical reactions. Cells actually literally produce heat too, so uh, cells and cars, neither of them are perfect and they, some of the energy escapes in the form of heat. 
The cell also produces carbon dioxide and water uh, as, a, as a product of, chem, uh, of cellular respiration. Uh, this carbon dioxide is then released into our, our blood. Our blood carries it to our lungs. Our lungs release it to the atmosphere. Literally, this is the, the carbon dioxide that plants will next take in for, for photosynthesis. So just thinking about relating the two processes there. I want to remind you that uh, calories, the concept of a calorie and how it relates to energy is not going to be on the exam. I don't feel like we have uh, the time or I don't think it's really required to re sufficiently understand cellular respiration, so calories will not be on your exam. Uh, keep that in mind. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, I think that's it for, for the second part of cellular respiration. Key take-home point for this part is that you have certain uh, sources of energy, for example, food uh, that we consume, that are high potential energy. There's lots of energy stored in there, we just need to break it down to get access to that energy. Okay, we need to break down those sugars uh, into their constituent atoms uh, to release that energy. We need to take fats and break them down into carbons and hydrogens. Okay, same thing with gasoline. It's high potential energy. You put into a system that can break it down. You provide a car with oxygen. It's an internal combustion engine. It'll break it down and give that car the energy needed to do what it needs to do, which is to move around to transport us. Same exact thing, guys, so keep these things in mind as we progress. Next time we'll talk about structurally ATP. You've already got a head start on this. You already know a lot about ATP, so it's going to be a pretty uh, easy section in 7.3. Okay, so hang in there. Uh, the first few sections are going to seem really, really easy, but we're getting to that 7.5 section where it's rather difficult. So hang in there with me. If you don't understand what uh, what's going on, please make sure you come and see me, okay? Uh, take care, guys. Talk to you soon.